Hello, everyone. Uh, again, uh, it's Mike from Highway 81 Revisited with my good friend AJ Jump doing another one of these Wait a While interview uh, podcasts. And joining us today from San Francisco is a uh, longtime uh, friend of mine is uh, Dennis McNally. And uh, a very quick rundown uh, for those of you not familiar with Dennis. He was a longtime publicist for the Grateful Dead uh, up until their demise in 1995. Uh, author of several books, including the 2002 New York Times bestseller, A Long Strange Trip, The Inside History of the Grateful Dead. And uh, I wanted to jump right in with the question. And um, Dennis, if you could just kind of tell us, what was the state of, of the dead when you officially became their publicist? What were you getting yourself into? Um, well, it was an interesting place in that... Um, they were on this, the Grateful Dead are unique, absolutely unique in show business history in that I'm really confident that there's never been another band or artist that steadily grew, whose audience steadily grew continuously for 30 years with one big spike, namely um, uh, uh, In the Dark and, and uh, uh, Touch of Grey. But generally it was just this they started very small you know 1965 and, and the, the very small scene um and for the next 30 years it grew uh i think largely because no <laughs> people came and nobody ever left but but uh on the whole uh, there was this steady uh enlargement so i came in uh, you know basically halfway through the the overall run of of uh, uh 15 I sort of became part of the scene uh, in 19, late 1980 um, and then became the publicist in 84. And uh, I, and then they, so that at that point, for instance, ironically, um, they, uh, they had, had not put out a record in four years and wouldn't for the first three years of my tenure. Um, and I, a story I, I think I can tell is that I, so, Somewhere in there, we were in New York shortly after I became a uh, staff member, and uh, I got a phone call from um, cousin, uh, not cousin Brucey, what am I saying? Um, Scott Muni, or one of Scott Muni's staff, asking if the band would be willing to stop by and, uh, and say hello uh, and, uh, and play poker, which is what they always did on the air. Um, and uh, I, not knowing particularly any better, I said to Jerry, uh, you want to go see Scott Muni? And he said, yeah, sure. Let's, you know, I'm bored. Let's go. So we went. And uh, later that day, or I guess the next day, I got a phone call from the, the, uh, the radio guy at, um, at uh, Arista Records, a record company, very politely, because I think he realized that if he just screamed at me, you know, which I kind of deserved, um, but really didn't know any better. Um, it, but if he screamed at me, you know, I'd just say, uh, up yours and hang up. Uh, and he kind of gently said, you know, it would be courteous if when you're going to go to a major radio or a minor radio station that you let me know about it in advance so that I don't have to be told by somebody saying, hey, you know, Sean, did you know <laughs> the Grateful Dead are on WNEW right now? Um, because we, I mean, I, you know, I've been probably the publicist for a year or two. We'd never talked to the record company. I didn't, I didn't start talking to the record company until um, 1987 when we had an album. You know, we were starting to work up to the process of, of producing the album. So we were, I was in this unique band, totally unique band that had an audience that, that, had a relationship with the music business, which was sort of on their terms. Um, and it was my job to maintain those terms and to, to, um, to maintain their individuality, their, and not to necessarily expect them now to say yes. Although in fact, generally speaking, I don't, in all that time, Jerry never once turned me down. If I said, I think we should do this interview because the, the gig needs it or more, more commonly, oh, there's some little pro the, the, the interviews were really more about um, like side projects, 
uh, stuff he did with Grisman. You know, we should we should do this with the Today Show because you're produ- putting out this album and if, with Grisman. And you know, and he he goes sure, and so we do it. Uh, and to, like towards the end, when he was, uh, frankly, the diabetes was causing him to be. He was ne- he was never the kind of guy that ever that he, with one exception in all the years I was with him that I ever witnessed him yell at somebody. It just that was not his behavior. But but when he was really, I don't know if you know a diabetic, but you know mood swing the sugar rising and falling mood swings are kind of brutal, and um, uh, so what he would uh, but so what he did in that case was just sort of withdraw a little bit from people and you know. You could see the black cloud over his head, and you would go, "I ain't talking to him," um, and and just avoid it. And um, and um, so, and the last two years of his life, I I didn't talk with you know. I certainly didn't you know talk. I I no, I didn't say hi, but I wasn't going to say, "Oh, you want to do this interview?" Because we didn't have stuff that needed it, and if we didn't need it, you know. So there was only one interview in the, the last year, and that was because I thought he'd have fun, and he agreed, and. And, and had a great time with it. But that was because it had nothing to do with, you know, anything um, like business. Uh, so you had three years to, with no album and then you had, you know, the album, uh, you know, they're on MTV and, you know, I, my first exposure to the Grateful Dead was the, the skeletons and the, you know, oh, that looks cool, you know, and when I was, I think, 10 years old, um, not knowing the 30 years that came before um what was it like you know how did your job change when now you're running publicity for a stadium band and a a chart topping band well they were a stadium you know very quickly a stadium band after i joined i joined in 84 i I remember vividly um in december of 85 um being part of a band meeting which wasn't a band meeting in the grateful dead we had two kinds of meetings. We had all company meetings, all personnel meetings, which were called band meetings. And they were, you know, formal, I mean, formal, as formal as they got, which meant, you know, we all gathered in, in the, at the studio, there was this giant table that was about 20 feet long and gathered around the table. Um, and then the, the, when the, the band and its manager and its lawyer only met and the crew, the crew chief, uh, those were called board meetings. Um, so we had a band meeting. Uh, this was an informal band meeting in which the whole band and some of the crew and I, and as I, I recall, that was it. Um, we were sitting around the lobby of the studio and they basically came to the conclusion and, and, and it was not like everybody was going, wow, this is cool. It was, oh God, we need to do stadiums next summer because you know, it just had become clear they had the 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 the, the popularity had grown so intensely um, that the only safe thing to do was stadiums, and there was a consensus that at that point we weren't quite ready to do them all on our own. So what you know, and the, the immediate consensus is so logically um, the person to partner with the, the band to partner with was the, was Dylan. Um, and, uh, this was Dylan with Tom Petty, backed by Tom Petty and Tom Petty's band. So that was in the summer of 86. And we did, I don't know, six or eight shows with, with them, uh, which went well, uh, on the whole. And then in 87, we had, uh, the, um, uh, the album coming out and we, we did, uh, uh, six or eight shows with just Dylan, with, with, it was called Dylan and the Dead, and we backed Dylan. Um, and um, that got more complicated because, among other things, Dylan, um, uh, uh, Dylan's people, um, Dylan, you know, is idiosyncratic. I mean, he's Dylan. Um, I mean, in all, in all the time that he was on, he was with us. I never saw him talk to anybody except Jerry. Uh, I'm sure he talked to other band members at some point, but I didn't see it. And he certainly didn't talk to me, which, you know, it's fine. Um, but he made my life a lot more difficult because he refused the, he did not want photographers around. And, you know, part of my job was to make sure that photographers got access 
but didn't bug anybody. That was sort of my magic act. I, you know, I got them in and I got them out. And as long as the band and the crew didn't have to pay attention to them, they didn't, the Grateful Dead did not care. Um, and same with TV. And we, you know, we had scads of it, but they never saw it, so they didn't care. That was, you know, that sort of was my job. Um, when I found um, a, a photographer from Time Magazine in the pit that I didn't know about because Dylan's people had decided that he was okay and it hadn't bothered to tell me. I almost had a knockdown drag out with, I, you know, with, it's like, excuse me, you know, you've run me through all of this meat grinder and now you're bringing somebody in and you don't even bother to tell me. So that's the, that was what working with him and his people was like. It was not, uh, it was not my favorite experience. Um, plus as he, is very candidly uh, admits in um, in Chronicles, uh, he did not hold up his end of the bargain in terms of the performance on that tour. He, long story short, he was he wasn't ready for the tour, and, and uh, it was ironic because, of course, this was the cleanest, soberest, and healthiest that the Grateful Dead ever were, and oh, they were ready to just blow it out of the stadium every night, and you know he was only half there, so. It was a little disappointing, but that's the way maybe you could uh, confirm or d deny this. There's uh, a book down the road. Have you read that one? Uh, Howard oh, Sounds. Sounds, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very yeah. good biography. Yeah, and in that book, um, he says the tour was over, and kind of the the dead were kind of relieved that we're not going to be playing with him, you know, for the time being. It, it didn't turn out the way we liked, and supposedly Dylan called the dead office, saying he wanted to join the band. That, that was well, in the book, is there? Yes, uh, I know it was in the book. Um, actually, I'm the source for it, um, because it's <laughs> okay. true. Um, um, he it wasn't after that tour. It was in the next year. Okay. He came to a show in LA. And it was a very peculiar show, because um, he refused to play any of his own songs. And he came out on stage and he didn't know the Grateful Dead. So we were playing Grateful Dead songs and he's standing there strumming, but you know, and the band is sort of looking at each other going, well, and eventually, I guess it was the opening of the second set. He came around, he hung around a little, took a walk through the crowd with a hoodie over his head. Then at intermission hung out and, they brought him out for the second set and they spent the entire first half of the second set wondering what he was doing there because he i mean with all due respect he didn't really know the songs and nobody quite knew what to do um and i, I won't identify the band member but a band member came off the stage at intermission uh, at uh, during the drums to go take a leak saying what the f is he doing here um <laughs> And um, <laughs> and then, yes, we heard, uh, that was great, um, you know, send me music, I'd really like to join the band. Well, that just sort of went away after a while. So, I mean, I don't, I, I, that was one of those things, it wasn't, fortunately, it was not my job to deal with it. And the manager, the manager was, among other things, uh, one of his skills was, you know, making things go away, so. <laughs> It went away. <laughs> those were those were quite different times. I mean, obviously, but uh, like what you had to deal with then. You you hear a lot about that now. Um, there's a lot of package tours now where bigger bands are are all touring together in order to fill larger places, in turn make more money. And then you hear about some back end stuff where you know the the co-headliners this you know oh well this band was supposed to fork the bill for this well we were only splitting this and you know so on and so forth what what are the challenges you know i mean those are synonymous things that will always happen with different managers and tour managers that have to play nice and stuff what are some of the challenges that that basically you had to deal with in those days that are kind of sort of synonymous with with today as far as a publicist but as far as dealing with a band that that 
you know, is not really of the traditional, um, you know, marketing aspects of things. You know, the radio, like radio play, not really something that you you had a lot of. And, you know, television, I'm sure you didn't, I mean, you did uh, the the famous Letterman, you know, when they were on Letterman. Were they on Johnny Carson? I don't, I don't. No, not Johnny Carson. No, certainly not in my, my tenure. Yeah. Let me tell you a story that's actually later, and it'll, I think it'll actually illuminate what it was like when it was the Grateful Dead. Um, so there was a reunion show in 2002 at uh, Alpine Valley in Wisconsin um, with all the living members uh, of the band, uh, uh, full members of the band, which is to say Phil, Phil and Mickey and Bobby and, 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 uh, and uh, Billy. And uh, I, think, I think it was Mark and Steve, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't even tell you for sure now. It was called Terrapin something or other, the Terrapin Gathering. And uh, this was our first show where, where we, it seemed like, I mean, there was also Rat Dog and Mickey had his band and whatnot, but th this was like the closest to a Grateful Dead show since 95. The last time we'd been in uh, Alpine Valley, we'd shut down traffic for all of Southern Wisconsin. I mean, it had been complete madness. They made a very big mistake, which was there were three shows by Dylan at Alpine Valley, which is a big amphitheater, 40,000 seats, um, or 40,000 capacity. And um, a day off and then us for three nights. And nobody, the parking lot never emptied in the interval <laughs> so that by the time our shows came up, they were parking for like, you know, 30 miles around. Um, so we come to 2002 and in the interval, that seven year interval, a guy named Bob Sillerman had created a company called, a corporation called, he uh, sold a chain, I think he had cable TV and he was a billionaire and he brought, he started buying all of the promoters in America that he could, which was m most. Um, and uh, the result was something called SFX, which eventually became Live Nation. Okay? So you had one corporation owning the touring capacity of America. In other words, it had gone corporate. To not, when I left in 95, it was local entrepreneurs taking their risks and, and doing their jobs in each town. And there were some that may, maybe went a little bit beyond their town, but you know, by and large. Uh, and suddenly we're dealing with a mega corporation and they're telling us, okay, we don't permit, and then, so it comes down to, you know, they, they like, they were in a panic about, you know, potentially being something like 1995. And I kept saying, guys, Jerry's dead. This is gonna, we're gonna sell out. It's not gonna be nuts. You have to trust me on this. You have to believe me. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, well, we're big corporate figures. We know what we're talking about. No, you don't. Not about this bunch. And, um, I mean, they had every they had every tow truck for two hundred. Uh, I exaggerate for a hundred miles, lined up, ready because that had what it had been like in ninety five. They sent them all home the first day. I mean, you know, they they kept five because nothing happened. Um, we pulled up the first day. I will never forget uh, in the van, and no one you know, in, instead of the usual circus of people looking for tickets and, you know, panicking and uh, even at, uh, you know, noon of, you know, a, a, of an evening concert, no one, zero, nothing. It's like what I said, and it's not like I was so sharp, but, you know, we knew. And we got into a, uh, so then they said, okay, well, uh, we don't permit cameras with, len with detachable lenses. And I said, we do. And I, you know, I said, no, you don't understand. 
part of the ambiance of the Grateful Dead for 30 years, for a long time before you were goddamn born. I was saying to one of these pipsqueaks, sorry, from SFX, who's starting to tell me what I can and can't do at my, sh my show, at our show. Um, again, I'm, now bands routinely sign contracts in which they cede all kinds of decision-making power to the promoter, in some cases because they pre-sell the entire tour. You know, the Rolling Stones, $400 billion for your tour. But after you've done that, it's not your tour anymore. It's their tour and you take orders. Now, you know, there's a limit to how many orders, you know, a sensible mega corporation will give, but things like cameras, you know, they don't care, they don't deal. So I'm going, nah, you know, that's not the way we work. And I said, and there's a good reason for that. And that's because these people are coming for, to a Grateful Dead show, they think. And just because of, it's been seven years, believe me, you know, it's the same people that were here the last time. And, and the fact is, actually the last time we've been in, in Alpine we, was in the 80s somewhere because it was such a clusterfuck that, you know, uh, it's just too many people. Um, so I got into, a, you know, a minor war with them. And I just said, no, you know, you're not, you're not telling me this. And I'm telling you that you're wrong. And there's a reason you're wrong because you're going to mess with the ambiance of the show. And you're going to have a million deadheads going back to their car, you know, not getting in or smuggling the cameras in or what you're, you're going to turn, you're going to create an issue that's, that, you know, doesn't have to be. So finally they call a meeting and, and all I, I, I vividly remember it is like, there's four or five of them and me. And one of them was a corporate communications consultant who's driving around in a car in New Orleans and it's pouring. So half the sound on this conference call is the rain on her roof. And I'm, you know, as mulish and obstinate uh, and just basically saying, you know, and they said, well, we had a problem in Cleveland because we were, there was a heavy metal show and they let cameras in and uh, the, uh, the audience started, they started having a mud ball fight, dirt clouds, they were, and people were shooting that and they got in the papers. And I said, you know, started holding my head with a headache and I said, look, A, this is not a heavy metal audience. B, so what? C, you know, D and E. The long story short is I did win that battle. Um, in later years with, with, for instance, with Rat Dog, I, I couldn't because we had signed these contracts that were like the corporate contracts where they controlled things. And we had shows where literally I had to ask for permission to bring our photographer, our personal photographer up on stage. That did not, you know, it wasn't fun. I am grateful to the gods and Jerry Garcia because he hired me, um, that uh, I have lived my life never working for a corporation. The Grateful Dead, whatever it was, wasn't, I mean, yes, it was incorporated, but it was not a corporation. Um, and I never had to, you know, I just never had to deal with any of that BS. Um, and I'm grateful that, you know, I was in, when I was in rock and roll, it was not run by, you know, three guys in suits in New York City, which is to say the people who, who book um, Live Nation and AEG and, you know, three important radio executives. And, you know, that's, that stuff, I mean, it's the way of the world and it's, I mean, it's the way of American corporate capitalism, um, the, all businesses. So it'd be shocking if it weren't going to apply to entertainment. But boy, am I glad I'm not part of it. Um, has, has there ever been a band as big as the dead that were able to operate as separate from that corporate machinery? I don't believe so. I don't believe so, no. I mean, how many, you know, it just came with the territory that you, you know, you, uh, I mean, the Rolling Stones, for instance, um, when they first began, uh, Andrew, Andrew Lug Oldham, their first manager, 
created this, this uh, threatening, dangerous uh, uh, persona for them. They weren't really. Actually, it was somebody, uh, and I can't remember who the quote's from, but somebody uh, quoted as saying, in fact, that the Beatles were thugs that everybody thought were like nice guys because they, they were funny and they wore ties. And the Rolling Stones were actually, you know, proper young gentlemen uh, that everybody thought were thugs, uh, which is pretty true. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, that before long, uh, for instance, their, because this is the world I worked in, um, their approach to the media was, you know, corporate control. You got a 15 minute interview with Mick. You, you know, if you were important enough, you, you know, you got 15 minutes to take a picture at the show, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, it was just mass produced uh, and they were big enough to, you know, they could say what they want. And they also did business that way. I mean, by the end, by now, uh, Rolling Stones routinely sign contracts that are 95% to the Rolling Stones, 5% to the promoter. Uh, now, or in fact, it's their promoter because it's pre-sold, but unbelievable contracts. Now, that's a very dangerous thing because for starters, in order to make a profit, I'm not saying a big profit, just a profit, um, you're going to cheat at 5%. You, you, you can't break even as a promoter, the local promoter who's supplying who's dealing with the insurance and supplying the stage crew and the medical and the, you know, the stuff. Uh, the Grateful Dead, even at their highest, you know, into the nineties, the, the industry standard when, when it got sort of settled out normal was what they called 85-15. So the band got 85% of the profit and the promoter got 15% of the profit after agreed upon expenses. And the promoters would usually pad the expenses a little bit, uh, gen you know, depending. There were some that were more honest than others. Um, but, uh, the, and the Grateful Dead never saw fit to change that. They felt no need. We never changed promoters either, even when we caught them cheating. It was like, part of the deal was we trained them. We, and I say we, a lot of this happened long before I got there, but, um, the, the band and the, its crew and its staff trained the promoters to deliver what the band wanted, which was the right sound. Well, we, we did our own sound as quickly as we could, um, but uh, security that didn't beat people, decent food, you know, just sort of general ambiance, which is what the promoter does. And um, once we had them trained, uh, you know, we kept them. Uh, it was very, in, 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 in some ways, it was a very conservative sort of approach. Um, there's never been a band, there's never been a band that cared so little about money and as a result was rewarded beyond their wildest dreams. Absolutely. And it's like, in some ways, it's like hard to, it was all, it was very zen and very paradoxical and just very, um, as I say, I, I can think of like one dramatic example of a show that the band took just for the money. Well, just for the money and because Bill Graham hammered them. And that was the US Festival um, in which they agreed to play at nine o'clock in the morning. It was billed as breakfast in bed with the Grateful Dead. <laughs> um, and this being the 80s and that era, they of course stayed up all night, <laughs> which meant they played, eh. Now I've heard it, they didn't play badly actually, <laughs> but they didn't play well, you know, or you know, better than well. They played well, but they didn't, you know, you would be wise not to expect fantastic. Um, but what had happened was that Bill, Bill had been, at the last second of the US Festival, Bill was brought in to save it from itself because it was basically being run as a front for Scientology. And uh, this guy, <laughs> Steve Wozniak of, of Apple, um, had gotten sort of sucked into this 
Scientology group and was was kind of naive and and um, you know he was your classic genius of of computers but not so sharp on the people front necessarily and uh, and so th there was a lot of hanky panky going on and they brought in Bill and so Bill decided that you know he had to pull out all the stops so he called the Grateful Dead and he he had known them for so long and it was very difficult for them ever to say no to him. So that's what happened. I uh, wanted to ask a little about your, your approach to managing interview requests over the years. And um, just speaking from my perspective, you know, uh, working for various publications, uh, you know, some would say you have 10 minutes, you know, uh, 10 minutes, there's not much you could say. Um, I was once interviewing uh, Slash from Guns N' Roses, and I was told uh, you, you can't ask about Guns N' Roses. Um, I was once interviewing uh, Phil Lesh, with, which was not through you, and I was told I can't ask about the Grateful Dead. So, you know, I want to give, giving that as context. The, the way I got to know Dennis was when these Grateful Dead post Jerry Garcia bands would come through the Scranton Wilkesbury market and. You know, when bands of that level would come through, we'd try to get an interview. And the first time I asked for an interview through Dennis, you know, he didn't know who I was. I called him or sent an email. Uh, Rat Dog was playing somewhere. And, um, you know, I asked for Bob Weir and, and uh, they said, well, we'll give you Rob Wasserman, which was, I was happy, you know. From then on, every time I got Bob Weir, Dennis, you never said, don't ask about this, don't ask about his family, don't ask about Woodstock. It was just, here's his number, give him a call. So there seemed to be like a level of trust there. So how, there. So, how, there. So, how so how I don't know what just happened. I don't know what just happened. Turn this down a little. Turn this but, down a little. But uh, uh, okay. Okay. Is it fixed? Is it fixed? Yeah, you're good. Uh, uh actually no, I'm now I'm no, getting I'm the feedback. Now. It's gonna be very hard for me to do this. And listen, and have to listen to me. I now mean, you yeah. sound normal. You sound now I sound better. normal. Yeah, whatever you touched, worked. Okay. Uh, so here's here's the deal. Um, and it goes back to Jerry. I'll tell you a story. One time, believe it or not, Rolling Stone called me up. The editor of Rolling Stone called me up and said, "Please, can we do an interview with Jerry? We have a." Cover, we need a cover story. We don't have a cover story for, uh, and you know, the idea of Rolling Stone owing me a favor, which they promptly forgot, um, uh, appealed to me. And so I went to Jerry, I said, you know, you wanna spend an hour on the phone with so-and-so? Yeah, sure. Um, and, I said, you can talk about, can that, talk about that project uh, with uh, Grisman. And the, the interview came out and there was like a half a paragraph on the project and nothing else. And I called up the editor ready to just scream. And he said, and I believed him, I tried to get him to talk about that. He didn't want to talk about that. He wanted to talk about Keelan, his daughter, who was then about three years old. And he was fascinated with certain, you know, learning patterns that she was displaying, the way she lined things, her toys up on the floor or something, whatever. But it was, I mean, he, he had a more sophisticated take on it, but the point being that people wanted to talk with Jerry because you would have a legitimate conversation, mutual, interactive. He wasn't, he never had an agenda. He never did an interview to sell anything. Mick Jagger was selling something, Jerry not. Most rock and roll, most entertainment interviews are to sell something. And you know, God knows uh, I was inclined. Uh, I mean, we were doing the interviews in part to get more, for instance, with, with Weir and Rat Dog, to get more exposure for Rat Dog to sell more tickets. But the fact is the Grateful Dead and after um, did not uh, feel any great need to pimp themselves. Thank God we had a, such a loyal audience that, you know, sales were not usually the problem. 
so that a that it, that carried over so later in later years it wasn't like i was um you know only i would i did not have to apply the same parameters that your average publicist does which is how big is it we did interviews with high school kids and i'd say to weir or whoever mostly weir because <clears throat> Uh, by then, I was working only with, uh, within the Grateful Dead world. I was working with him, not not uh, uh, many of the other band members. Um, and I, 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 or a college, you know, paper. And I'd say, do this one; it'll be all right. And um, so that was a. And then B, it's just absurd to do a ten-minute interview uh, or a 15, 20 twenty-minute interview. Um, at the very least, you know, like a half an hour, you know, is the, a chance to have a conversation. Um, and because, you know, again, we have nothing to sell except who we are and you can't get that in 10 minutes. So, so yeah, so that was, that was my approach to it. And I've, I've, I've occasionally had, um, I've, I've had a lot of clients since the Grateful Dead. Um, and every once in a while, there'll be somebody that will say, you know, please, you know, tell them 20 minutes. And I'll say, okay, 25 minutes and watch the clock. And nobody, nobody gripes. The point being that, that uh, every once in a while, of course, there's somebody that, I'm thinking of one guy in particular, and it doesn't matter who, one of my favorite musicians of all time. And he has fans that, you know, are like puppies around him and, and, and you know, and, it, and he's a great storyteller and they'll go 45 minutes and shamelessly. And it's like, you know, and then they get me in trouble because they do that. Cause then he goes, you know, why am I doing this quite this long? So of course he brought it on himself by being that good an interview, but that's, that's the way it goes. Dennis, who are you? Uh, who are you excited with uh, for working with right now? Like, who, what's an artist or two that you're you're really excited about currently? Well, right now, uh, what are, what are my three clients? Um, I'm very excited actually about a guy named Alex Jordan, uh, who has been with Midnight North for the last five years, Graham Lesh's okay. band. Um, yeah, I've played with him before. And Alex, uh, Alex has a. Uh, uh, actually, it came out yesterday, two days ago, Friday. Um, a new CD uh, that's now available on, you know, on the platforms, digital platforms. Uh, we haven't gotten the actual physical product yet. Sometime this week, I think. Um, and it's called The Subtle Exhibitionist. And he played all the instruments except drums and sang all of the vocals. And it's a really good album. Um, Obviously, he can't tour. Nobody's touring. So, um, and I'm working with, um, what else? Uh, I have a really interesting new client that I've been working with for the last three months called um, the Little Village Foundation, which is a nonprofit record company that goes around and looks for quality music that just is not likely to be picked up by the commercial radio records companies um and they just they're right now they're partnering with uh, the arhuli foundation arhuli records is a legendary uh record company that, that actually started in 1960 by a guy named chris strakowitz who brought zydeco for instance to uh the rest of the, out of louisiana to the rest of america uh with clifton chenier uh, um, and the blues and, you know, sort of American roots music. Um, and he's finally retired after about 60 years. And, um, and so the foundation um, and Little Village Foundation are collaborating on something called Working From Home. And I, I urge you to go, um, since I don't, I can't recite the, uh, uh, it's on YouTube, but I can't recite the, the URL. So just go to littlevillagefoundation.com and, uh, and you can, um, uh, you'll see, working from home. The first, is, it'll be a weekly half an hour or so um, 
uh, you know, iPhone, simple, at home uh, music performance by uh, the first one is these two sisters, uh, Anya and uh, Zochi um, Morales, and they're, uh, they're uh, college age young ladies from um, Delano, California. And if you happen to know California, Delano is the home of the, of the uh, United Farm Workers, uh, where, where it was established by um, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta 60 years ago. And um, which is to say it's, it's what you call R-U-R-L, rural. And, and mostly it's farm workers. And um, the two of them, if it weren't for the virus, would be uh, going to class at Harvard. So they're exceptional people and they also play mariachi music, uh, fiddle and, and vocals. It's fascinating. Next week's um, uh, release will be a Zydeco star. Uh, the week after that is gospel. So it's an incredibly, and you know, there's an opportunity to listen to great music and if you can and, and feel it's right, um, give them a tip uh, on, you know, online. Um, and you know, tip, tip, was it tip the waitress? And in this case, tip the band. Um, and um, uh, so that's, that's one of the things I'm working on now. Um, and then um, I'm also working uh, closer to home on something called the Skull and Roses Festival, which has happened now th twice, didn't happen this year for certain obvious reasons. And it's, the idea is that, that it comes up every April in Ventura, California, which is where the Grateful Dead played a bunch at the fairgrounds there. And it's 30, um, a word we never ever use, uh, Grateful Dead cover bands. So 30 bands playing Grateful Dead music. Uh, some of them are famous and some of them are local, um, but it's a complete, completely sincere homage to the Grateful Dead scene by uh, the promoters, a guy named Chris Mitrovich, who, who looks, as I told him to his face, so I'm, I'm not worried that he'll hear this. Um, he looks like a slightly aging, as in like his, in his 40s, slightly aging LA jock, but in fact, he's a stone deadhead hippie. Um, who who absolutely has the the ethic and the ethos at, at, at in his heart, and we'll be doing this uh, magazine weekly starting in July. Um, we haven't given it a name yet, um, but it'll have something to do with skull. Maybe we'll just call it the Bone. Um, but anyway, it's uh, the Skull and Roses Festival, and it's uh, it's that's obviously connected to to what I do. And then um, I work with Zakir Hussein, who's maybe the world's greatest musician. I'm serious when I say that. In the, he's, in the, he's in the running. He just won Downbeat's percussion, best percussionist of the, of the year, um, which he's he should incredible. win every year. And <laughs> truly one of the greats who's played with everyone that you could ever imagine. Um, but uh, I work with him when he tours and for the, <laughs> he, he hasn't been home for so long since he was 16, I think. No, younger, I swear. He started touring at about 15, and he's the greatest tabla player in India. Um, and I work with Steve Kimok, who almost did a, um, Kimok hasn't been home so long and forever. So yeah, that's, that's who I work with. Nice. Well, Dennis, uh, I think we've taken enough of your, of your time. I really appreciate you uh, doing this and telling us your story. And um, not, not just tonight too, I just want to thank you for being gracious over the years to me. And uh, as my cat comes by here, okay, you could go under there. Um, just, to, you know, we came out to see Dennis uh, about two years ago, uh, Audrey and I, and he was very gracious, showed us the Beat Museum and took us to a great Chinese restaurant. And um, Randy's yeah, just thanks for just being a good guy. <laughs> well, you're entirely welcome. Um, I have, um, over the years, you know, I've got, um, a, a network, a gang of low types like yourself um, all over the country um, that, you know, uh, have over the years become friends and, and my, my work instead of, in, I've seen people pretend to be publicists and, you know, play games and try and strong arm people and all that. And it, it's so wrong. <laughs> 
it's just so wrong. Um, and I, you know, I ask favors and, and, and sometimes people, I ask people to, you know, cover music that, well, that's a little bit of a reach for them, like some radio guy. And they usually say yes, mostly because I'm pretty careful about trying to make things fit um, and not be too far a reach. You know, asking, I'm going to ask you as an example uh, to talk about this gospel group uh, that I'm working with now um, because it's, it's wonderful gospel music. Um, and Jerry, um, uh, you know, for instance, Jerry, one of the advantages to all this is that the Grateful Dead was a, it wasn't just their music, it was a, it was a synthesis of a world of music. So that if I'm talking to a deadhead radio person, th there's 30 flavors of music they could very possibly like. It's not just jam band, quote unquote. So anyway, um, that's, that's what I do and, um, and it's still fun. So um, it's my pleasure to talk with you and, uh, you know, be well, wash your hands. <laughs> All right, Dennis, thanks, well, thanks a lot. And uh, hope to Take see care. you soon in person. Uh, I would like that. All right, be good. All right, Peace you to too. Meet you, Arthur. Yeah, nice to meet you too, Dennis. Bye. Bye-bye.